here today for our Soundless live show, which is a book by Rochelle Mead. Are you excited, Reagan, for today? Yes. I'm so pumped to have Rochelle Mead Month be our theme for December, as I'm a huge fan of Rochelle Mead. I have read many of her novels. I know. They're so good. And also, um, I can't wait to, like, jump into this book because, like, comparing this book to her other novels, it's, like, unrecognizable, like, that it's actually her besides, like, the amazing writing. Yeah. I can't think about that. Yeah, that's definitely, I will say just, like, briefly, I really just enjoyed this book, Soundless, just because it's such a different and unique novel coming from Rochelle. I just, mm -hmm. I don't, I just... And just in YA in general, it's yeah. something I haven't seen before. In terms of questions, guys, um, do we have a hashtag, Sasha? Yes, it's just Peruse Utopia, and it's on Twitter. So just tweet us your questions or put them in the comments of this video, and we'll answer them at the end of the live show. So go ask them. And also, oh, oopsie. Do we have a hashtag? You can also um, comment on the actual live stream as well. I'll be looking on there. So there's two different routes in which you can ask your questions to your heart's content. Yes, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> I'm so excited to be doing this because I'm actually really excited to talk about this book. Yeah. So, um, how about I'll start this time with my right. opinion rating. Um, so, Soundless. I really enjoyed this book, not just because it was so unique with the sense that the char main character is deaf, everybody around her is deaf, and it's about her, like, um, learning about this sense that is totally normal to all of us, unless you're deaf, um, and, like, kind of grasping it for its entirety. And I thought that was a really cool aspect of this. And also, it's a standalone fantasy, which I loved. And it was not very long. And I was getting worried towards the end that it wouldn't wrap up nicely. But it did. Mm -hmm. It did. So um, all in all, I did really enjoy this book. Um, I wish we got a little bit more from the characters. Um, and I totally took that from Reagan's, uh, <laughs> Reagan's review of it because I totally like agree with her on her review because um, I did enjoy the characters. I wish we just saw a little bit more of them. Um, and so I gave it a 3.75 out of 5 stars, which is a really good rating. I enjoyed it. Reagan, yeah. what is your opinion? Well, so I agree with pretty much everything you just said, but I would say my favorite aspect of this novel is the Chinese influences. I'm a history major in college, if you didn't know. And so, like, I don't know. I love authenticity when it comes to culture, representation in novels. Yes, this is a fantasy novel, but it is clearly very influenced from Chinese culture, Chinese folklore. So I just appreciated that she definitely used an Eastern perspective as inspiration instead of making a story that is Chinese, but still had Western cultural um, communications and things like that. That just wouldn't make sense. So there's just a lot of stuff in here that I just appreciated for the research that she did. Um, in terms of like the writing, I felt like it was very true to like a classic Chinese tale, which I really liked. But also her nods to just Chinese culture, like clearly an influence of Confucianism, which is a type of social philosophy, I guess. If you don't know what Confucianism is, it's just basically code of conduct for living life and civil life. Um, it's not so much of a religion, it's literally just like how people function within society and hierarchies. And it was clearly seen in this novel in terms of how men and women from different classes interacted, how men and women in general interacted, how you know shame and family matters were very important. I just really liked um, just the cultural perspective this novel had and I really appreciated it. So that was definitely my favorite part of the book, again, I wanted it to be a little bit longer just so I could have more time with the characters because, I don't know, like, while I liked them, I wasn't attached to them because it was so short. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately, I gave it a three out of five stars, I th it's, which for me is a pretty solid rating, and I just liked it. I thought it was a pretty, it was a very unique young adult novel, which I appreciate. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and I have to add on like the whole entire um, folklore with Chinese folklore. I've honestly never read a book with Chinese folklore in it, yeah. and I'm really happy I have now because it has opened up this whole entire new world of literature for me. Right. And I actually did some research on the folklore it was like based off of because I also love history and I am not majoring it, but I'm minoring in it. Um, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I made the decision. I just need to tell my school about it because. <laughs> I want to get a master's in history just because, I mean, why not? And I want to go to Scotland, so why not? <laughs> That's why. Woo! But, yeah, so, like, I did some research on it, and it's actually very interesting. And, like, um, how do you pronounce it? Is it called the Pixu? The Pixu? I, I um, <laughs> pronounce the I and I don't know Chinese. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to butcher that. <laughs> I was struggling really hard, like, trying to pronounce, like, what the actual, like, um, folklore of it was, but it was really cool, and I loved doing the research about it, and honestly, it did stay true, like, the Chinese feel to it, but also made its own fantasy elements to it as well. Really loved it. Yeah, 
And you know what I also really appreciate about this book was the representation of deaf individuals. Mm -hmm. For one, the whole village was deaf and no one was, it was, it was a novel about people with disabilities and they weren't disabled. You know what I mean? It was just, they were just, they were functioning normally within their society. And that was just their reality. And I just appreciated how they represented like every, it was just, it was normal and it was just it's nice. Normal, yeah. I don't know. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say, but it was just no, nice. You said it really well. Yeah. I think you said it really well. Like it's normal. It's not like it's not a disability to them, and it shouldn't be a disability because yeah. it's just something that they're born with. It's yeah. something that happened, and they adapted to it, and they are fine. But yeah. except when they start going blind, yeah. that's when the big yeah. issues start happening. And also, guys, this is a spoiler live show, so if you have not read this book yet, please know that it's spoiler. So well, if you want to see like spoiler free, go to our reviews. Well, like, obviously, them going blind when they communicate visually is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. But imagine us. Imagine if you and I all of a sudden went deaf mm -hmm. sign language wasn't invented. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it'd be like, whoa. You know, it's just a matter of adapting. And it was just a really yeah. interesting society to see. Because clearly, these individuals adapted. And they were functioning just fine like any other human in the world. So. Yeah, no. And, like, did you also, like, um... In a way, like, I thought about sign language and stuff, and I'm taking it as my language in school okay. in the next, like, coming years. I'm really excited about it. Um, but the thing is, I, one of the things I kept on thinking in this book, and even after it, I was thinking about this, was how does somebody learn sign language when they're born deaf? And they, like, it's almost like, um, to me, it's confusing. But then once I think about it, like, if I take yeah. myself out of, like, the position I am in with, um, I'm very blessed to have all my, like, my hearing, my eyesight. Yeah. But, like, um, once I take myself out of that, they're just learning how we learn language just yeah. in a different way. And I find that so cool. Yeah, this is very unrelated to the novel. But in terms of, like, cognitive ability and language learning at a young age, like, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. Side, sidebar, it's fascinating. Children uh, to the age of like four can mm -hmm. pick up languages so easy. And yeah. like if you reach an age of like six and then onwards, it becomes in like exponentially more difficult. So like for a child who's born deaf, you know, obviously someone who knows sign language just teaches them and they would be able to learn it just like they would be learning to speak. You know, it's just like another way for them to speak. So I, I don't know, it's just interesting and that's just a little random no, that's totally, but then you're totally right with that because like when i was younger i was fluent in polish and then my grandma left to go back to poland and i lost it all because i was 10 years old i wasn't speaking it every day and then it just gone away yeah. so it's so true like when i was younger i picked up really easily and i spoke and i understood it i still understand it but not as well and yeah. so that is so true and that's um is that psychology no yeah psychology the cognitive stuff. Yeah, I learned about that stuff. Yeah, it's like cognitive ability and mm -hmm. also like linguistics kind of. Yeah. Um, so you know what I also thought was just an interesting thing in the novel was the descriptions of sound, right? Yes. So when she regained her hearing and now she's, for the first time in her life, encountering these sounds that she literally has no reference to mm -hmm. and how she's then trying to describe these sounds to other people. Because if you think about language, the sounds that we know the words for them is the sound they make. Yeah. Like a ring, like a dong, you know, like it's like they, they sound like the word. So to be able to describe it to someone who can't hear it, it, it was very interesting to see. It was it. very, I love that. I was about to bring that up because, okay, take yourself, um, for example, like we know what colors look like, but to a yeah. blind person who was born blind, how do you describe colors to them? Like this exact same thing. So it was so cool. I love being put in that position. Yeah. And I actually took myself out of like the position I was in, like I said before, and I put myself in Faye's point of view. And I'm like, this is really cool. And I think that um, Rochelle did a really good job with it. Yeah. Back to that idea of describing color. Like every time I try to think about it, it like melts my brain because I'm like, I don't know how to describe it. No, you can't. It, it is. It just is. It just yeah. is. It is. <laughs> it, it's so, it's really hard. And like, it also makes me just grateful that I can have all my sights and right? hearing. And also, um, with the village people, a part of this novel, like how they're going deaf and how they're deaf and they're going blind. Like yeah. you can't do, like you can still do stuff, but yeah. you can't when you're in their position with like right. food shortages and like, um, you're homeless now. And it just it definitely it's awful. makes their lives more difficult in terms of, cause like, you know, for them, like as a society, they've had time to adapt. And like all of a sudden, if everyone goes deaf and blind kind of at the same time, it'd be very difficult for them to therefore adapt and be able to maintain how their society's functioning because it just it wouldn't be able to. I'm sure ultimately people would be able to figure something out, but still scary for them. And understandably, because for one, they were getting so screwed throughout that whole novel. I know. 
<laughs> oh god it was like i thought on a really interesting like the whole entire um aspect of her getting her hearing back and then her trucking down the mountain with what was the guy's name again um i totally pronounced it wrong the whole entire time but the guy's name um well he um how he was deaf and she like just because she had her hearing, she was able to lead them down like, this treacherous journey of like a mountainside. And then, like um, another thing that I found interesting was the reason that everybody's going um, blind was because of the metals, and that's what also made them go deaf as well. Well, yeah, that's like, a total, that's like a totally real thing, like mining gold. I was actually thinking about that yeah. in the beginning of the novel. Like I was like, huh, I wonder because like mining gold is extremely dangerous and really toxic. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of laws to keep the um, the remnants of mining gold out of water supplies because it's just very like poisonous. Mm -hmm. So like while I was thinking, literally when I started the novel, I was like, I wonder how they like don't die of like arsenic poisoning or something. I, know. I realized that that's why. And it was like so creepy. Like when she found that village that was on that plateau, yeah. and like how everybody that was like her, technically her village, but just in a different time, and how everybody died, and yeah. it was like from starvation that was probably one of my favorite parts like the thing about this novel like it, everything was kind of linear because it's kind of supposed to be like a folk tale and normally folk tales feel very linear like you know mm -hmm. kind of it feels natural in its progression but like even still i was very entertained like especially when she got to that village those were probably some of my favorite pages of her exploring and like being obviously freaked out about what she's discovering and then obviously getting like a whole new set of like urgency that she needs to go and like help her village the one thing i wanted more of was her actual time in the valley and like mm -hmm. finding out the politics of why these people you know like push deaf people aside you know like i wanted yeah. to see like that like more world building i know yeah like like you said it's a very linear novel because folklore is like that but honestly i wish there was more world building because i was really curious yeah. about it mm -hmm. and um I bet that if this book was just an extra 100 pages longer, she could have added that in and kind of explained it more. But even though this book was like, this book was very short. It was like 266 pages. I read it in like a few hours. Yeah. It was really, it was an easy read, but it also was satisfying to know that it wrapped up cleanly in the end. So even though there was still some questions as to the world building and like what comes after this, yeah. um, it's still very like satisfying to finish it. Right. Like I was never... I never felt like I was left hanging in terms of what the characters' lives were like. And in fact, like, I found, like, the last couple pages to be very interesting to see how they were adapting yeah. to a new scenario. They were, like, farming, and now because they had, like, a pathway down the mountain, so they were, like, farming, and how some of the creatures were giving people their hearing back and how yeah. not everyone really wanted that or some people didn't really like it, which I also thought was interesting because just because you're deaf doesn't necessarily mean you want your hearing. You know what I mean? Like, it's, like, it's weird, yeah, to just like all of a sudden regain your hearing and like, like I'm guessing it's weird. Yeah. So like it, it, it brought up some interesting points that I really liked. Should we yeah. ask questions? Um, oh, I want to have one more point. Um, the oh. romance in this. I felt like the romance in this novel could have been really rushed and forced, but the reason that they were actually um, not romantically involved, but mm -hmm. had this relationship before the novel actually started, like way before, gave us some like structure to it, so yeah. it did not seem rushed or like all of a sudden like just yeah. there. And, like, yeah. That's something I definitely also appreciated about this. I was able to buy that romance as it developed so quickly because they had past history and they already had those feelings for each other. They were just separated by the social classes within their own society and they yeah. were accepting those differences. Um, so I definitely bought it because I would have had an issue if they just met and fell in love and like, yeah. okay, you know, but like yeah. they already had feelings for each other. So like that part of the story, I definitely easily bought. And I also liked how he was an artist yeah. But it was interesting to see how his, uh, their town didn't appreciate that type of art, so therefore it was deemed, like, useless, even though it was beautiful in a lot of obvious mm -hmm. ways. So I thought that was, was interesting. And, like, um, one more thing I just thought about is, yeah. like, let's compare this to Vampire Academy for a second. Right. We have Rose, who's a very spunky, hilarious, very um, impulsive uh, character who yeah. we love. And then we have Faye, who's very put together and very professional, but she also has this heart that is um, that we see grow. And yeah. the characters are so different, but they are done so well that I'm just so happy to see this side of Rochelle Mead because yeah. I... I've never, like, really seen this side besides maybe in Bloodlines yeah. with the main character there. But, like, I like I just really like seeing her change it up a bit. And it was really awesome to see that, well, too. I liked Faye as a main character because I felt like she was realistic. Yeah, she and was. I, you know what I mean? Like, there's a society, like, she 
did what she had to do to su support and help her sister out. Like she gave up romance because she had a duty that she felt like she needed to pursue first. And I appreciated that. She felt like she had a duty to her village. So she put herself in danger. Like I just felt like she was very honorable as a character and very realistic and like how she was behaving. So yeah. I, I appreciated that. I felt she was very strong in a more like reserved way. You know, yeah. like, it wasn't rash. She didn't make fun of like Rose is very like jokey, like, you know, yeah quick wit, like we'll make fun of someone. And like, that's not Faye's character. Like she's, you know, very respectful, very reserved, but like very honorable and very brave too. So and that's like more of like the Chinese culture coming in. Like, um, that's how they're very respectable. And I really appreciate her like creating a character that was also realistic to the culture that it's like associated with. Yeah. Um, and I also love the diversity in this novel because honestly, like the past few years we have been talking about, we need diverse books yeah. and this is just like adding to it. And I love it so much. I feel like yeah. 2016 and 20 end of 2015 and 2016 is going to be a really good year for diverse books and diversity and I'm really excited to see that happen no I totally agree it's so, about there's a question I want to answer because I have an answer to it yeah Megan is asking uh for those who enjoyed soundless what other books would you recommend that have similar themes for mm -hmm. this I recommend it's right next to me it's really <laughs> Eon by Allison Goodman. This is a fantasy duology that follows a young woman who's in a Chinese inspired world. It's a fantasy series. It has to do with dragons. It's very cool. I really, really like it. It has a very realistic social interactions in this novel too. It was a really, really great. So if you like Soundless, but want maybe something more fantasy and larger in scale and scope, read this. Also. I have a book too. Woo! I have a book um, okay, so um, I, I can see definitely um, it kind of relating to Queen of the Tearling because the relatable character sense, because the main character Queen of the Tearling, what is her name? Um, Kelsey. Yeah. Um, yeah. She yeah. was very, very relatable. She was not yeah. like this beauty. She was very ordinary, but it made her special because she had the, she made me like feel like, okay, so for example, if you are not like a supermodel gorgeous, yeah. like how you see in a lot of books, you seem, you kind of feel bad about yourself. And then you see like a character like Kelsey and like, she is like ordinary. She's like you and me and she is such a badass. She's a queen and I love seeing that. So in a sense, like this could be definitely similar to Soundless in the way of relatable characters and right. realistic. Yeah, I would say like uh, Queen of the Tearling, great book if you want, just like another example of a strong realistic female character. Eon, if you're interested in those cultural uh, Chinese, references you could go there because it's very eastern um inspired i'm trying to see if i have other ones because i know i've read more but just things are just escaping my brain story hmm. of my life <laughs> i'm looking, looking my bookshelf look like it's falling down on that side oh. <laughs> because it's like all tilted because half my like um my jennifer L. armatrop books are like with me on my table here <laughs> How is, how are you liking your new bookshelves, by the way? I'm loving them. I got them from Ikea, and, like, so, like, that's my arc shelf, and, like, these are, like, my normal bookshelves, and literally this whole entire shelf right here, right here, <laughs> is, like, Jennifer L. Armatrout books. <laughs> I'm not even joking. That's yeah, all of them. You have the same bookshelves, you know, right Yeah, there. Oh, I, Ikea, Billy bookshelves. Yeah. Yeah, but I only have two, and then I have, like, the thin the one. Thin half one. I think I'm going to get a thin one for right there. Yeah, I like, want to keep them, but uh, I don't know. I'm moving so much right now, so. Yeah, so it's like, it's real. I got them because I'm moving, and I needed to get the other, like, on-the-wall shelves off the wall, so. Right. Yeah. For, the, for that purpose. Exactly. But, but yeah, I so. Are there, are there any other questions? Let me see. I feel like we answered, like, a lot of them just, like, discussing it because I was looking through them. Okay. Well, tweet us, guys. We like, we like tweets. Um, someone asked us, did we like the setting? And what was our favorite part of the setting if we did like it? Oh, I definitely love the setting of the mountaintop. Um, right. because, uh, when I first saw it, I, I pictured it very small, but um, then it went more in detail with it, and it kind of built in my brain. So, like, it started off small, and then it expanded. And I really love just, like, the setting of a mountaintop um, village. I feel like everything else is, like, misted over, and it's just, right? like, this yeah. really cool, like, like, visual, like, coolness to it. I love it. Exactly. So, you know, you've seen um, Legend of Korra, right? Uh, yeah. 
So you know the first season. I haven't seen. I've only seen the first season or the second season. I've seen whatever. I've seen enough. You've seen it all. So you know the episode where I they do like the origin story and it's all like watercolored scrolls mm -hmm. and like they have all those like mountains and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what I visualize with this land. Yeah, yeah. That's so. And do you know what I think? Um, this would be um like wait, why am I pointing at my phone? This would be um a great book to movie adaptation, but not with a live action one, but actually animated, animated. one. I think I'm really cool. Yeah, I agree. I love oh animated stuff. I there's a lot of books I just read generally. Like people are like, this should be a movie. I'm like, yeah, but animated. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. wish that they did that more often because they have it. Like, they need to mix it up, change it yeah. up. I think that they should do that with this. Well, like, adults can like animated things, too. Like, Japan's got it together because they make adult animation that's still pretty. But, like, in America... Yeah, exactly. It's... And, like, I feel like in America we have this, like, perception of animated films being, like, um, you know, like, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants or, right. like, stuff like that. But then you see, like, things like Avatar and it's, Avatar's like... best. So good, and like I loved it, and I'm 18, and like I know my dad would like it if he watched it, just because like he would appreciate like the cinematic aspect to it, um, and just the storyline is really cool. So, okay, um, let's see. Oh, here's a good one. Um, this is from Megan again. Um, so I think this is the same Megan. Um, so she's asked, "How did you guys react to the social hierarchy?" Mm -hmm. It was interesting seeing art at the top, um, and those uh, careers usually aren't valued. Um, do you want to well, start? I would say, at this time period, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you look at it structurally, you have the higher, more gentle, gentle, um, intellectual slash. I'm trying to use the word, like a more civilized pastime, such as art and writing. Um, if you look at like Confucian-based societies about Japan and China, these are practices that are like highly valued. So it makes a lot of sense versus like miners being at the bottom who are laborers. So it's like, it's, it's just ranked in a logical way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, to me, it made sense with what she was doing. And I thought it was really interesting because a lot of times in a lot of modern Western novels, especially novels set during the 20th and 21st century, um, artists aren't really appreciated, especially artists who are going against like the grain of what is considered acceptable or whatever. So it's definitely interesting to see. But I think it was um, I think it was true to the setting of the novel that artists would be on top. Yeah, I thought that was, uh, like, I see, I didn't really know that. I didn't really think about that. So I thought the artist being at top was a really cool aspect to it, but it also, in a way, made sense, like, not in, like, the way you were saying, but it made sense to me without knowing that because um, usually, like, minors, uh, the job is very lower class in any, like, society that you think of in books. Um, like, for example, like, Hunger Games, like, the minors there, they're, like, the last um, yeah. district. And so um, it made sense that they were the lower ones, but... Honestly, I would have expected, like, maybe the priests, um, because there's, like, a priest in there to be, like, the top, but um, then it made sense that maybe um, the artists were, because they were ones, like, sharing um, the news, and they were the ones projecting that. Yeah, they were definitely, like, the government structure, too, because wasn't the elders artists as well? Mm -hmm. So, like, very, like, that makes sense. I like that aspect. Was there a priest in this? Um, yeah, like, um, when, um, the guy, I can't forget his name, it was, like, <laughs> I forget, but, um, when his dad died, uh, they called the priest or something, uh, like, to be, like okay. the last ritual, right? And usually priests, um, in history, like, the Vatican, like, they've always been, like, the top, like, um, at least in, like, the olden days, like, Leonardo da Vinci time. I'm really into Leonardo da Vinci right now, it's ridiculous. You're, you're totally right in terms of Catholicism and, like, Western thought, but again, it makes sense that religion wouldn't be on top in this society because, well, Confucianism was kind of, it was very, like, China at an early stage in history was very separated in church mm -hmm. and state. Um, it was like your work life and your family life was ruled by Confucian thought and your government life was uh, ruled by that. But then, like, your spiritual life was led by, like, Buddhism or things like this. But those are very individual religions. But there are Buddhist priests who do burial rites. So it might be something like that. But, yeah. I, but again, like, I just like that it's true to, like, a logical historical setting which is just something i appreciate because nothing drives me more cuckoo bananas like real talk when i read a historical fiction novel or a historically influenced novel and it literally doesn't make sense i have such i have to stop reading things sometimes because it just angers me really like, especially when it's like a fantasy novel with russian influence um like 
Shadow and Bone's not an issue because that's like vaguely influenced, just yeah. vaguely. But I've read stuff that are like set in Russia, but they just have magic for some reason. And it doesn't make sense. Like, oh my God. I'm like, no, these characters wouldn't even know each other. What is going on? Oh, and like, it makes sense. Like, if um, a book is like, if it states that it is an alternate history, yeah. it's okay. But if it yeah, isn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, I, I see you. I see right through you. Yeah, like an alternate history, like clearly just influencing, like Wolf by Wolf is an alternate history. Like, obviously, yeah. that's going to be different than what actually happened, which I'm reading soon, by the way. I it's really so, like it. so yeah. good. I, I think I'm going to read it in January. I'm excited. But, like, some books that are, like, clearly historical and they're, like, not properly historical, yeah. I'll be like, no. No. Go away. Stop. Stop right there. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so this is an interesting one. Um, this is from Celia, and she asks, uh, what time period did you think the book is set in, um, though it is fantasy? So, um, what do you think? I think you're better to, like, answer this one. Um... That's a great question. It's kind of, I honestly don't know. I guess I could say before the Boxer Rebellion in the 20th century, like early 20th century, before China became communist in the communist revolution. I don't, I don't know. It could be literally, there just wasn't enough clues and China has a very long history. It could have been, it could have been a span of like in between a span of like 2000 years that this book would have taken place. I don't know. Like I'm thinking like, um, I, see, that's the thing. It was I think I think earlier it, more than later, but I think it's very much earlier, just because like the world it's set in and the way that everything is. Because yeah. like they had like um they used wood to build like their fence or something around the city, and so like that shows that they're like um I don't, I, I don't know if that would even make sense, but uh, maybe around the Mulan time, I can see that <laughs> Mulan time, whatever that is. Mulan's I everything. Think I love Mulan. Mulan Dynasty, but. That would be, like, before. That'd be, like, BC. Really? I would think that would be cool if it was BC. But I don't know. But, like, the use of wood is pretty cool. I don't know. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like it's so it, hard. It I'm trying to find a little plot point back to, like, market. There's, like, so many. Like, there's just such an expansive amount of time in Chinese history. I'm trying um, to see if no, I any. think it's earlier. Like, I think it's definitely, like, before or after that, Sasha. But I, I don't know. It's I, so I, I, I can see it in Mulan's time. I definitely agree to that. I love Mulan. Yeah, uh, Mulan's like one of my favorite favorite movies. Does it say in the notes? Let me see. That's what I was thinking because um the folklore it's after is. I bet we can do some research as to like what the folklore is. Usually they have end notes that say what it is. I know the folklore is like a PXU. Mm, I don't see it. I don't know. I mean, I guess it's supposed to be like, I don't know. It definitely feels like it could be a multiple time periods. I think it's probably just because it is folklore, so it doesn't really have itself rooted in a specific time. Okay. Um, I have I have won the legend, so huh. it's loading. My Wi-Fi sucks, but I may have it. Okay. Right. Um, no date? No date? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't um, know. Oh, oh, uh, actually, I said it's like um, the third year of the reign of Zhang He, and that's like 90 BC. Zhang He. I'm going to Google Zhang. Let's, let's Google Zhang. Zhang He. Hey, Zhang He. Emperor. But he's in Dynasty Warriors. That's where I recognize his name from. Really? <laughs> I mean, I mean, that is based off of. Like real people, mm -hmm. but let me see here. Let's see. He died in two hundred and thirty-one. <laughs> wow, that that was after the common era, so a long, long time ago. It was, during, long time. it was during the Han. It was during the Han Empire. Okay. Hey yo. Oh, it was. It was. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so um, let's see if there's any more questions. Because I'm excited, and that's what our next book club book is. We also is still need to talk about the glittering court. Oh my god! Oh yeah, we need to talk about that. Um. Oh good. Uh, do you want to talk about the glittering court? Yeah. So I'm first like, off, we have these cool necklaces inspired by Ooh. the novel, The Glittering Court. So this is Rochelle Mead's 
upcoming novel. It comes out in April, and it sounds honestly like so stellar. This is going to be a series. So this is not a standalone novel, and it's influenced by two different very interesting threads of history. It follows our main character, Adelaide, and, um, well, I should say, the two interesting threads of history are Elizabethan era England and also, like, colonial colonialism, like the transition to new world frontiers and stuff like that. Very cool. So our main character, Adelaide, which is an awesome name, love that name, oh, yeah. and, uh, she escapes this Elizabethan society, inspired society, because she has an arranged marriage and she doesn't want to marry the guy, which first off, awesome. So she <laughs> runs away to this new world and joins something called the Glittering Court, which I believe, from what I can gather from the back, is like a school, but also a business venture um, designed to transform impoverished girls to make them like able to marry well. Um, it's probably a lot more to that. And there she meets a boy who I'm sure is a lot more than he seems. Okay. And we're going to have a nice old school Rochelle Mead smoldering romance. Cause I hope I miss her like smoldering romance. And like, I'm just excited because this is all going to be court politics and like mm -hmm. dresses, which is literally one of my favorite things in the entire world. <laughs> I know. It's so nice to like picture that stuff. Like I'm really excited about this book just because it's been on my, like one of my most highly anticipated reads of yeah. next year. Um, because uh, first of all, uh, we've gotten like Rochelle Mead books, but they've all pretty much been in the same world, which is like the Vampire Academy world. Right the past few years so we haven't really seen her do another series which i'm super excited about and like also i'm not sure if anybody else thinks this but doesn't the main like doesn't the character on the cover um whatever the model she looks like the girl who played uh rose in the movie oh yeah you're kind of right you texted me about that didn't you yeah yeah i was like this is is this her like i was so confused and i tweeted it out turns out it's not her but it's a look alike so like i just want this to be like kind of like gossip girl <laughs> that was so fun. You know what I mean? But you know, like, like, look, like, look at her outfit. Like, clearly, I just want a book that has like kick-ass female women who don't necessarily kick butt in a physical way, but kick yeah. butt in like a mental and maneuvering way. And they also love clothing. That's like that's all I want. That's all I want. It's like very pretty dresses, and like I think it's fun. And like honestly, um, one of my favorite books, which is like the Sonic Glass series, yeah. um, is Lena, and she kicks butt in a dress. Like she loves right. dresses. She's that's girly. Something, that's something I appreciate because I feel like recently we were having like kind of a resurrection of the feminine character that is okay. I felt like a lot of times our our YA female protagonist had to be frumpy, someone who didn't care about clothes, didn't care yeah. about makeup, which is of course is fine. As a female, you don't have to care about those things, but there are females who do care about those things and are proud. It can still be a force to be reckoned with, can still be smart, intelligent, driven, kick butt, can still be an assassin or can still maneuver their way around court politics. So that's just something that I like to see in YA novels too. I like both, obviously. I don't want everyone to be the same, but it's just more something I can relate to because I like clothes and makeup and I like to think of myself, you know, as a strong female. So I yeah. can see it. No, like honestly, because I like relate, to, I relate to both characters like that love getting like all glitzy and glammy, yeah. but also the ones who like being in sweats and just yeah. chilling on a Friday night. Yeah. So like, it's nice to have that like differing um like things in like uh, literature. I really like that. Exactly. I think the world is starting to finally represent females in the um, accurate ways of the past, you know, yeah, decade or so. But it's just nice to see. I'm always, I'm always gung-ho for it. Oh, right, again, after we're done with the live show, I want to talk to you about something that has to do with, like, the um, dresses and versus non-dresses, but you, everybody else will find it boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, so we're, I'm really excited to be reading um, The Good Lettered in Court, and, like, I'm just really excited. Rochelle Mead has been on a roll with getting out books, like, in this, like, like kind of year. Yeah, like, I'm really happy. Trout in that way. Is Bloodlines finished, the little book? Um, I thought the last, I thought, what was that? It's the pink cover one. I thought that was the last one. Yeah, that's what I thought. Google it. I can't think of it, because it's not Silver Shadows, obviously. Right. Last one I have is Silver Shadows. Did another one come out? Oh, are you watching Sherlock tonight? <gasps> I forgot that was on the Ruby. Me story. too! The Ruby's, is it, but what is it on? Like, can it's I, on where can I watch it? It's on where? 8 o'clock. But where? Who? Oh, um, Masterpiece Classic. What is that? Um, It's like this, like, I don't know if it's a premium channel or not, but do you have, like, Xfinity or cable? No. I'm a college student. 
That's why I take my dad's. <laughs> it's going to be online like tomorrow. It'll be on Netflix. I feel like Sherlock is always on Netflix pretty quickly. I could be wrong. Is it on Netflix? Well, Sherlock the show is, and I feel like they always... That'd be awesome if it is. I hope so. Oh. It's not a series. I mean, it is a series, but it's not like you can about that. I need someone to help me. Help me, please. Help me. Help me. Watch Sherlock before Tumblr ruins it for me. Literally, though. I like I said I don't go on Tumblr. I go on Instagram, and that ruins I it. Stopped, so I stopped tumbling because I just kept getting ruined for things. I was like, I quit. I'm I just, I now, I, so I'm not doing it anymore. I got almost spo- somebody almost spoiled me for City of Heavenly Fire and gave me a false spoiler, but I got so mad. You put on my picture on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. No, that's where that's a first. Yeah, that's where I saw it. Yeah, and and I, I, I was like. People who post spoilers are the worst kind of people. <laughs> I know. And then I, like, um, somebody also did one of mine, and then I blocked them. I'm like, no, I'm not having this. I'm yeah, not doing like, this. This ends today. Like, I don't mind people talking about spoilers, but, like, give the book, like, a day to be out. Like, it wasn't, I mean, like, an hour. Yeah, there's, like, a certain amount of time. Like, for example, people, like, like I feel like everybody should not, like, be spoiled unless they want to be. Yeah. But sometimes, like, if a book's been out for, like, five years – like it's gonna happen i got spoiled i got spoiled when i was um moderating um sarah's uh event for uh queen of shadows by yeah. sarah for harry potter but i couldn't get mad because i'm like it's been I, out it's, it's been harry out. potter man <laughs> harry potter at that point like i feel like harry potter is the benchmark for things you should be able to speak freely about because it is yeah. harry potter <laughs> it is and like honestly i've been like pretty much spoiler free so i'm really happy that's so nice. That's like kind of astonishing. Honestly, what, what were you spoiled for? What, what were you? What was ruined? Hedwig. Aww. Yeah. At least you're prepped for it now. Oh, yeah. I remember that. That was sad. I remember when that happened. <laughs> so oh. sad. Okay, so um, do you think that concludes our chatting about glittering court and yes. Did we talk about month. next month's book? Yeah, let's do this. Um, so I have the book. Reagan doesn't. Oh wait, that's not our book. That's the wrong book. Okay, so um, since we had such a good uh, December, we're hopefully going to be carrying that on in January, and I have a really good feeling about this next one. Yeah. So without further ado, our book club book of the month for January, the first one of the new year, is Curio by Evangeline Denmark. Although this book does not come out until the 4th of January, which is literally just next Monday. week. <laughs> yeah. It's Tuesday. Books come out on a Tuesday, Reagan. Oopsie. <laughs> I, always, I always wonder why they come out on a Tuesday. It's interesting. But it's coming out on Tuesday, and so get it, and we'll be reading it next month, and our live show will be on – let me get the date up. Let me get – wait, why am I still in December? Okay. Um, we're going to be on the 29th of January, which is a Friday. Woo! Hey, I'm pumped because – Second month in a row, we're doing fantasy, and I am all about it. <laughs> I know. This one has, like, chemists in it. It has, like, this curio cabinet. And I hope I'm pronouncing it right, right? Curio? I, 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 that's how I would say it. Curio! And hey. it has, like, this, and the girl on the cover, she looks like this one actress, but I know her as, um, Dylan O'Brien's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he has a girlfriend? From my dream. Yeah. Dress. I'm so sad. I'm his girlfriend. Oh. Oh. Uh. I hate to break that to you. Who is his girlfriend? Um, it's just Brittany. Oh no, no, not Brittany. Is it Brittany? Brittany, maybe. I'm gonna Google it. Dylan O'Brien. Girlfriend. This is so off topic. Oh, she's pretty. Oh. Doesn't she look like this girl though? Yeah, I can see it for sure. Yeah, but um, so this book is about this girl, and her name is Gray Howard, and so she lives in like this um undeveloped like society i think and it's like kind of like western based but it's also like um fantasy and it's like these chemists control her society it's about her going into a curio cabinet and like um these porcelain like dolls in life and it's all this crazy stuff happens and i'm just excited really excited to read this book and i find it very difficult to summarize this novel because like so many things seem to like be going on in it and i'm really excited to see what happens no that sounds awesome i'm excited to get my hands on a copy when the holidays are over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, do you want to finish the remarks? That's, uh, I don't know. Um, that's what, folks. <laughs> okay, that's all, folks.
Woo! And if you guys want to go check out Soundless or The Glittering Court, I'll be linking both the novels down below. And check out our book reviews on Soundless because they are up now. They're spoiler free. So check them out. Yay! Great. Thank you guys for watching. And we'll see you next month with Curio. Bye! Bye! Bye. Stop.